So this lecture will be a rough survey of some of the representations of the group GL2. Um, so by representations, I'm going to mean complex representations. And GL2, you recall, is just the set of two by two matrices of determinant um, non-zero, so they're invertible. And of course, it has to be GL2 over some field F. And you want to know what F is? Well, there are some popular choices for F. F might be a finite field. Um, so it might be FQ for Q, a power of some prime. Or it might be a p-adic field. So it might be something like the um, p-adic integers. Or it might just be the real numbers. Or it might just be the complex numbers. So these are the most popular choices. You can also look at other things like it might be a, um, a power series ring over a finite field or something. Um, well, first of all, GL2 is almost a product of the group SL2 times GL1. Um, so there's a map from SL2 times GL1. So you can just think of GL1 as just being the diagonal matrices and SL2 just means determinant um, equals 1. And this obviously maps to GL2 and it's not quite onto in general, it's not quite injective in general, but you sort of get an exact sequence where this is something small and this is something small. So representations of GL2 are almost but not quite the same as representations of SL2 times representations of GL1. So when people first studied representation theory, they started with representations of SL2, but people soon noticed that representations of GL2 are actually easier and better behaved than SL2. So normally what you do is you do the representations of GL2 and then just sort of restrict to get SL2. Um, the, the reason why GL2 is better than SL2 seems to be it's um, to do with the fact that if you look at the algebraic group GL2, the centralizers of elements are connected. And for slightly complicated reasons, if you have an algebraic group with this property, its representation theory tends to be a little bit easier than in general, whereas SL2, the, the centralizers aren't necessarily connected. Um, so uh, so the, the key theme about representations of GL2 is that representations of GL2 form families um, corresponding roughly to representations of Cartan subgroups. So this is not an exact correspondence, it's just sort of a, a rule of thumb. Um, this is actually a special case of um, a, a much more general collection of correspondences called Langland's functoriality, which tells you very general conditions under which representations of one group give you representations of another group. Um, so I'd better explain what is a Cartan subgroup. Well, um, the simplest example of a Cartan subgroup is just the diagonal matrices AD00 zero, zero of GL2. And a general Cartan subgroup is, roughly speaking, a subgroup that sort of behaves a bit like this. Um, so in particular, we notice this subgroup is abelian and its elements are semi-simple and it's sort of maximal and it's connected and so on. Um, so you can define a Cartan subgroup to be something with some collection of these properties. The precise definition of Cartan subgroup actually varies slightly depending on who's defining it, so you have to be a little bit careful. Um, but for GL2, it doesn't really matter. Um, so semi-simple means you want to exclude abelian groups like um, the group of these elements here. So, so this does not count as a Cartan subgroup. This is a 
uniposate subgroup which behaves quite differently from the, 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 the ones with semi-simple elements. So, um, so an obvious Cartan subgroup is, is the group of diagonal matrices. There's a slightly less obvious one. So let's look at the group GL2 of the reals. And we notice the reals is contained in as a subset of the complex numbers. And the complex numbers is isomorphic to R2 as a real vector space. So, so the complex numbers act on R2 by multiplication if, if we identify R2 with the complex numbers. And this gives us a map from the non-zero complex numbers to GL2 of R. And it takes um, A plus BI to um, AB minus BA. And this is another Cartan subgroup. Um, you notice it's abelian and semi-simple essentially because these numbers here are. Um, of course, they want a b would not be zero zero, otherwise this wouldn't be invertible. Um, and we can do the same trick for um, many other fields. So, if I take a field k and embed this in a bigger field, big K, with um, which is um, two-dimensional over little k, then we get a map from k star to gl2 of little k um, just by identifying k with k squared and letting big K act on k squared by identifying it with k. So if big K is equal to k of root t, which we can assume if the characteristic is not two, then and what we get is a Cartan subgroup which looks like elements a, b, t, b, a, with determinant a squared minus t, b squared is not zero here. t is some fixed element in, in little k. Um, there's a sort of special case. If, if we take t um, equals one, then we have big K is K of root one. Um, and this isn't really a field, it's, it's really a sum of two copies of K. And this gives us, uh, as our Cartan subgroup, just um, um, matrices in the form A, B, B, A, which is actually conjugate to the set of diagonal matrices. So um, the, 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 the obvious Cartan subgroup of diagonal matrices corresponds to a sort of degenerate extension of the field K where, where, where the extension actually splits as a sum of two fields and all the others correspond to non-degenerate extensions where you, where you take a field. Um, and I said the um, representations of Cartan subgroups should correspond to representations of the uh, general linear groups. So, so, so um, if we take a Cartan subgroup plus a representation, this should give you a representation of GL2, except it's a bit more complicated than that because you know this representation might not be irreducible and so on. Um, in the special case when the Cartan subgroup is um, K star plus K star, so it's just the diagonal matrices, um, this correspondence is very easy to describe. You just take the induced representation of um, this group here. So we first, um, if we've got a representation of this group, we can treat it as a representation of this group just by letting these this element act true. And then we induce from this group called a Braille subgroup up to GL2. So for diagonal Cartan subgroups, this correspondence is fairly easy to describe. It's just induced representations. And these are called principal series representations. And they're mostly irreducible, but sometimes they're not. Um, the others are rather tricky. And the names of them is a, is a little bit hazy. They're sometimes called discrete series. Um, they're sometimes called lots of other things as well. Um, um, 
the, the name discrete series comes um, because people originally did this theory over the reals and the discrete series occur discreetly in L2 of GL2 of the reals, or more precisely, I should say SL2 of the reals, because they don't occur discreetly in GL2 of the reals. Um, now, over other things like finite fields, discrete series are not the only representations that occur discreetly. Um, but the so over other fields, discrete series tends to mean something which is vaguely analogous to discrete series over the reals. I mean the, the naming of all these representations isn't really completely rational and or systematic. Um, so um, now let's take a look at um, GL2 of, let's just take a finite field of order P. So um, this is order, it's easy to work out, it's just Q squared minus 1 times Q squared minus Q. Just count the number of ways of taking a basis of a two-dimensional vector space. And we want to find the Cartan subgroups. And as we saw, what this means is we want to find the two-dimensional extensions of FP that are fields or sum of fields. And there are two ways of doing this. We can take FP plus FP, or we can take FP squared. So there's, there's a unique degree to extension of FP. And this is giving us the diagonal Cartan subgroups. And this is giving us Cartan subgroups that look a little bit more complicated. They're, they're sort of a bit like the complex numbers only only more so. Um, um, incidentally, we, you can also describe the Cartan subgroups of GLN of FP in a rather similar way. What you do is you just write N is equal to N1 plus N2 plus N3 and so on. And then um, FP has a, an extension that looks like FP to the N1 times FP to the N2 and so on. And um, so you get a Cartan subgroup which looks like non-zero elements of this field times non-zero elements of this field and so on. Um, you can also see the number of Cartan subgroups is going to be something to do with the number of ways of writing N as a sum of small integers, which is the number of partitions of N. Anyway, for N equals 2, we can write 2 is equal to 2 or 2 equals 1 plus 1, so that is 2 partitions. These correspond to our two Cartan subgroups. Um, so let's see what we get. Um, so um, these are going to give us the principal series, and we can see there are Q minus 1 squared characters of degree 1 of this, which gives us Q minus 1 squared representations of GL2 of FQ, if you induce them up. And these all have um, dimension q plus 1. And some of them are reducible. So um, um, q minus 1 reduce as 1 plus a q-dimensional representation. And this is a very interesting one called the Steinberg representation. And the others... Um, um, well, the, 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 there are q minus 1 squared minus q minus 1 other one-dimensional representations. These actually pair off. And what we do is we get q minus 1 squared minus q minus 1 over 2 representations of dimension 1 plus q, which are irreducible. The reason we um, these representations form pairs is that... Um, Matrix A B zero zero is actually conjugate to B A zero zero, um, and this sort of symmetry of the Cartan subgroup means um, that the representations sort of pair off, and um, we only get this number of um, irreducible representations. Um, well, there are some other representations you get from F P squared. So the other Cartan subgroup F P squared. Um, um, what this gives us, um, so this is going to have q squared minus 1 characters, so we get um, q squared minus 1 representations of 
GL2 of FQ, and of these, Q minus 1 turn out to be something like the Steinberg minus 1. This minus 1 is a little bit funny, and maybe I need to explain it a little bit. And then we get Q squared minus 1 minus Q minus 1 over two representations of dimension q minus 1. And the, these ones are sometimes called the discrete series. So the question is, how do you construct the discrete series representations? And this is actually a little bit tricky. Um, there are several ways of doing it. Um, none of them are totally trivial. Um, so I'll just mention a couple of popular ways of doing it. Um, one is due to Drinfeld. And um, um, what he found is you can get these representations inside the et al. cohomology of a suitable um, variety. Um, and um, this turns out to work really well for groups other than GL2. In fact, Deline and Lustig sort of took Drinfeld's idea and really ran with it and managed to construct similar representations for all other groups. And Lustig used this to work out all irreducible representations of all the simple group, finite groups of, of uh, Lie type. Um, and using a tal cohomology, um, Drinfeld, you, you actually get the, the, these representations appearing in a sort of Euler characteristic, which would be a sort of first cohomology class minus a zeroth cohomology class. And what you do is you, you find one of them is the Steinberg representation and one of the other homology groups gives you the trivial representation and you subtract them to get the Euler characteristic, which is where this minus one comes from. Um, another popular way of writing these is using a Ve representation. Um, where what you do is you really take um, a Ve representation of a bigger group, like it might be the symplectic group, and um, what you find is that uh, this contains SL2 times um, um, Fp squared star, and you can take the Ve uh, representation of this group and decompose it as representations of SL2 times representations of this. And this gives you a correspondence between representations of this group and representations of this group. If you do that, you find the thing corresponding to the trivial representation here is actually as dimension Q rather than Q minus 1 as, and, and as the whole Steinberg representation. And so anyway, there, there are several ways of constructing the discrete series representations. Um, so um, let's give a few examples. Um, let's start by looking at GL2 of F2. Um, so this is order 6. It's actually isomorphic to the symmetric group on three points. And you've probably all seen the character table of this group. It looks like 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, where this here is the dimension of the representation and these are the values on the conjugacy classes of GL2. And of these representations, this one is the one-dimensional one. Um, this one here is the discrete series, and this one here is the Steinberg representation. Um, there's actually no principal series representation. If, if you look, the number of principal series representations is actually zero for F2. So this example is a bit misleading and the, the most common sort of representation doesn't actually occur. Um, if you look at GL2 of F3, um, then its representations have dimension 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3 and 4. Um, of these, this is the principal series. Um, here we get the Steinberg representation. You've heard there's only one Steinberg representation. That's for simple groups. GL2 isn't quite simple, so you can you can get more than one. These ones are the discrete series, and these are the one-dimensional ones. 
um, if you look at GL2 of F4, then this is actually, well, SL2 of F4 is actually isomorphic to A5 of order 60. Um, but GL2 means you sort of also multiply by Z over 3Z. Um, so what for these, we take the representations of A5, which are dimension 1, 3, 3, 4, and 5, and we multiply all of them by 3. So we get 3 copies of 1, 3 copies of 3, another 3 copies of 3, 3 copies of 4, and 3 copies of 5. So these are the dimensions of the representations of GL2 of F4. And as before, these are the Steinberg. Um, and these are the principal series, I guess, and these are the discrete series. And so you can go on like this. Um, let me show you a more complicated example. Um, let's do GL2 of um, uh, 17. And here is uh, um, here it is in the Atlas of Finite Groups. I don't know if you can see it very well. Um, this is the character table in a sort of compressed format. And if you wrote out the whole of the character table of GL2 of 17, it would cover pages and pages and pages. So, so um, they had to compress it a bit. And if you look here, there's a representation of dimension 17. That's the Steinberg representation. Here's the one-dimensional representation. Um, here are some 18-dimensional representations, which are the principal series. And here are some 16-dimensional ones, which are the discrete series. And here are some nine-dimensional ones. Well, where did those come from? Um, well, I never said anything about nine-dimensional representations. Well, what they come from is um, that one of the principal series representations of dimension 18 actually splits into two nine-dimensional representations if you restrict it to SL2. So this is really the character table of SL2 over 17. And um, this vertical line here means that if you were looking at GL2, you should um, sum these two representations together. Um, if you look down here, you can see two eight-dimensional representations, which are one of the discrete series representations splitting when you restrict it to SL2. Um, so um, next I'll say a little bit about um, representations over the uh, p-adic numbers. So let, let's look at GL2 over the p-adic numbers. And um, as I said, first of all, what you've got to do is to find the Cartan subgroups. And to find the Cartan subgroups, we need to look at the degree two extensions of QP. Um, well, there's one obvious degree two extension, which is QP plus QP. So this is the degenerate one that isn't a field. It's the sum of two fields. And then you can also look at QP of root n for n and none residue, or QP of root p n, or QP of root p. So there are three non-trivial degree to extension. So we, 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 we expect to get three discrete series. And one principal series. Well, that's not always true. This is for p odd. Um, for p equals 2, it gets more complicated. So for p equals 2, we get q2 plus q2. But q2, the two adic numbers, actually has seven quadratic extensions because we can add root 3 or root 5 or root 7 or um, root 2 or root 2 times 3 or root 2 times 5 or root 2 times 7. So we get seven discrete series, um, so, sorry, seven series of discrete, discrete series representations. That's not seven discrete series representations, it's seven series of discrete series representations, if you see what I mean. Um, so the, the principal series are mostly irreducible. Um, 
Um, a few are not. Some of them have a one-dimensional sub-representation or quotient representation. So this would be the one-dimensional representation. And if they have a one-dimensional sub-representation or quotient representation, then the, then the leftover piece is called a special representation. So the remainder is called the so-called special representation. And if you compare this with the um, representation over finite fields, you see the special representation corresponds to what people doing finite dimension, doing finite fields would call the Steinberg representation. Um, these really ought to be called the same thing, but um, it seems that the people who um, discussed representation theory of finite fields and the people who did p-adic fields weren't talking to each other as much as they should have been, so they came up with different names for what is essentially the same thing. Um, um, as I said, uh, there are also discrete series representation. Um, these are usually constructed by using the Ve representation, um, where you take a sort of metaplectic representation of some simple for a uh, uh, sim symplectic group for a four-dimensional vector space. Um, now, if, if P is odd, this gives you all the representations. We get three discrete series and some principal series and some special representations. Um, if P is equal to two, this isn't quite true, although some earlier books and papers sort of imply that that's all you get for P equals two as well. <clears throat> However, Andre Vey noticed there was something fishy going on. Um, so there's some weird stuff for P equals two. I mean, we've already seen some weird stuff. We get seven instead of three discrete series of discrete series. Um, but um, things get even weirder than that. You get things called tetrahedral and octahedral representations. And I'll try and explain where these comes from. Um, first of all, um, according to Langmuir's philosophy, the representations of um, GL2 of, of, of a p-adic field should have something to do with um, um, representations of the Galois group of um, QP, that means the absolute Galois group, um, in um, GL2 of the complex numbers. Um, and what Andre Vey noticed is that there are extra representations of this in when, when, when P is equal to 2. And let me explain why, why you get these. Um, so if we look at GL2 of C, we can quotient out by the centre and look at PGL2 of C. And PGL2 of C has a well-known collection of finite groups. Its finite subgroups are cyclic or dihedral, or they can be the tetrahedral group A4, or the octahedral group S4, or the icosahedral group A5. Um, on the other hand, um, the um, Galois group of the absolute Galois group of the rationals looks like a P group times a cyclic group times a cyclic group. And where this is something to do with wild ramification, this is um, ordinary ramification and so on. So what we want to do is to ask when can we have a map from a group that looks like this, which is some sort of Galois group, to one of these finite groups. Um, well, if the image is cyclic or dihedral, this turns out to be all the representations we already know about the principal series and the special representation. So these are sort of accounted for. A5, it can't have image A5 because A5 is not solvable and this group here is solvable, so we can cross this out. But A4 and S4 are both might be possibilities, so let's look at their structure. Well, A4 and S4, both of structure looks like z over 2z squared dot z over 3z 
and then there may be a z over 2z on top of that in the case of s4 but not for a4 so this is this is sort of optional um, and then we're also taking a central extension of that by gl2 so there might be a z over 2z sitting in there so we want to map p group by cyclic by cyclic to this sequence here now we can see how to do this so we can map this cyclic group to this c over 3z and we can map this cyclic group to this bit here and we can map this p group to this group here if p is equal to 2 so if p is odd we can't do this but if p is equal to 2 then we get all these strange extra representations of the gamma group of the p adic numbers which can be tetrahedral or octahedral and by langland's um, correspondence this ought to give you extra representations of gl2 of qp now actually pinning that down is hard work um, in fact, if you try and prove the Langlands correspondence for GL2 of QP, you spend about half your time on these funny representations of P equals 2, just trying to trying to sort out what's going on. In fact, that, that, that was the last case of it that, um, that, that that was the last case that had to be done to prove Langlands for, for um, over P adic fields. Um, <clears throat> Finally, I'll just say a little bit about GL2R and GL2C. And again, to find their representations, you first look at the Cartan subgroups. And for GL2R, there are two Cartan subgroups. We can take the diagonal matrices or we can take AB minus BA. So this is really a sort of copy of the complex numbers. For GL2C, there's only one sort of Cartan subgroup, optoconjugate secret, which is just diagonal matrices. So GL2C, the representation theory is particularly simple. All we do is we get the principal series, most of which are irreducible. Um, for R, we get some principal series. And we also get some discrete series related to representations of the non-zero complex numbers. I mean, it turns out the discrete series aren't really new because if you take the principal series, most of these are irreducible. But some decompose as either finite dot discrete series or as discrete series not finite. In other words, they've got a, they might have a, a finite dimensional sub representation so that the quotient is a discrete series or a finite dimension or a discrete series sub representation such as the quotient is finite dimensional. And you can spend many happy hours writing down all representations of these two groups and inducing them and working out exactly how they decompose. And um, this is the result you get. Um, and um, again, just as for finite fields, if you're looking at SL2R, um, some of these representations tend to decompose. So um, discrete series representations decompose as a direct sum of two representations. And again, you can spend many pages of calculation um, working out exactly which representations decompose and how they decompose. 